Right, go live, and we are live. Terry Adams, hi. What's up, bro? Hi, I'm just hanging out. This is my first Sunday morning podcast. I'm kind of stoked to see how it goes. Hey, sorry about that. I uh, I know I picked a day, but it's I'm, kind of the day that worked. I'm cool with it. This is a day where... I wasn't going to do anything anyway, so I'm pumped to just have a fresh mind. Just woke up, like, get the day moving. Pumped. There you go. I'm, I am as well, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So the first thing and the big thing that I hit you up about with all of this that's the news right now for the Flatland world is the ABFL. I want to talk a little bit about that first. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh kind of is what it is. It's the American DMX Flatland League. Um, An opportunity opened up uh, to do something new and fresh with uh, a series here in the U.S. for Flatland. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm listed on the the website as the founder. And but, you know, it was really just kind of my idea to kind of bring the community together because really everything else was in place. There was, you know, three other contests that were already happening with like three really dope organizers. Um, so, uh, one of the organizers of the first stop is Art Thomason. Um, he's been in the flatland game forever, riding for Hoffman bikes from man. It's gotta be like over 20 years. And he's just been like a name in flatland. That's been super reliable and dependable. So he already had his event. He was like two years strong in Houston. Um, so he'll be stop one and, uh, stop two is going to be in North Carolina. And that's a guy that's been in the game forever, respectable flatland rider, Brian Huffman. He had been running his stop for a few years. I had also attended that one. It was super dope. And then Chris Young, uh, legendary flatland guy, um, that rode with the plywood hoods and a part of the plywood hoods for many years. He had started a clothing brand, flatland assassins. At when he kind of made his resurgence back into the flatland world and um, <clears throat> that clothing brand, he was starting to like give back to other riders and starting to build a team. And then he just kind of jumped in the mix and said, I'm going to do an event. And he did his first event uh, last year, which is the battleground in Ohio. And so that event went amazing. I was there as well. So it was kind of like everything was already in place to kind of just, gather the troops and get everyone on the same page to uh, kind of bring this thing together and just do a, a, a new fresh series. Um, that makes sense. So. And so like at its core, the ABFL, like what would you say it is? Is it just a series? Is it a thing that is putting on this series? Yeah, it's, it's like a governing body league but the governing body is just like the flatland community here in the u.s you know it's just like a couple guys that are going to get on a zoom call after each event to figure out how we can make each individual event better how we can take the league and grow on it every year and just work together because we're obviously with flatland being as small it is as small as it is here in the United States, like we're going to be stronger and have the opportunity to grow flatland here in the States if we work together. So we're just stronger working together than apart. So I just figure, man, if we can get everyone on the same page and get this thing going, um, we could do something great in the long term. And man, it was relatively easy to just, get everyone on the same page and and agree to to work together so that's awesome and it definitely feels like the response to it has been huge over the the past week yeah i think really um flatland needed something new and it needed something fresh here Mm -hmm. in the states because we have a a strong community but uh, a lot of times you look at the United States compared to like Japan and Europe, we're just all the riders are so spread out, you yeah. know, we're, we're all over the place and it's not as simple as being in 
in Japan or Europe to where you can just take trains everywhere to hit these events. Um, so for everything to be connected and for riders to want to go and gather their, their points all year, it kind of gives everyone something to really look forward to, especially if we're bringing uh, a new, fresh uh, vibe for the series. And that's, that's really the goal. Heck yeah. So gathering points for the year, do you guys already have something planned for like the, the end result of it? Yeah. I mean, we're working on that right now, but obviously there'll be like a cash purse. Um, and look, all these events that are going on, um, we're not going to change the structure of the organizers events at all. You know, nice. um, we're just going to let these guys keep doing their own thing because their events are great. That's why, um, we chose them to be a part of the league. And then, you know, really what we're offering these organizers is just um, an opportunity to be a part of something that can help Flatland grow here in the States. That's really cool. I love hearing that because you're just, you, you have these already existing things that are doing a good job and people are stoked on. You just bring it all together into something larger, which can take it to a whole nother level. And that's cool. Yeah. And really, um, you know, I'm going to be at these events as a rider, you know, for, for first and foremost, like that's really um, where my heart uh, is, still is right now. Even at 40 years old, I'm just extremely motivated to compete and, uh, and be a part of the series that way. But uh, I'll definitely be like a rider rep representative to kind of speak my mind when I feel like um, something should be changed or something we should try to implement at, at one of the stops to, to make it better. Um, but as far as contests uh, in general, I was a uh, kind of the right-hand man for the voodoo jam that happened many, many years here in the States, in New Orleans. So I wasn't the main organizer, but my best friend, Scott O'Brien, was the main organizer. And we had, you know, support from the Flatland community uh, worldwide that came and had been supporting that event since 2004. So um, although I wasn't like I was riding at those events, I really got a front row seat to how Scott um, made that event so great over the years. So um, I felt like I had a little bit to offer to where um, I could kind of take that role of not really giving advice, but just kind of giving input uh, throughout the year with the series. That's really cool. So who else is on board and helping with it? Man, uh, really, when you when I think about the ABFL, like, I feel like the entire Flatland community is going to own this thing. So there's obviously like a lot of people helping out on the back end. There's those three organizers that are like extremely important because without them, it wouldn't be happening. So again, that's Art Thomason running the Houston stop, Brian Huffman running the North Carolina stop, and that's uh, legendary Chris Young uh, running the stop in Ohio. But uh, we have Pat Schoolin with at Flatland Fuel. Uh, that's also kind of helped me kind of round up all the troops. So uh, he's listed as a founder as well uh, on the website there. Um, Todd Carter is helping with the points and uh, keeping everything on track to make sure uh, everyone gets the proper points after each stop. Uh, Jay Marley uh, is helping with all the, the logos and the branding with this thing. So it's really a collective effort of a, a lot of a lot of people. You know, my friend Mickey Guidos is going to be at each stop doing some, you know, some videos to kind of recap each event. So but again, it's really everyone. It's all the flatland, everyone that shows up to these things you know um we kind of feel like uh everyone's an, an owner of the abfl if you're there supporting it and you're there to uh see flatland grow here in the states um man it's just as much as everyone's uh as it is ours so what a cool way of doing it i feel like that's how a lot of people talk about different events and the way things run the way that it should be that way. And now to see you guys actually doing it that way, that's, that's cool. Yeah. You know, um, it's kind of taken a page out of like the, 
Japanese playbook. If you like, I've been traveling to Japan since like 2002 and they just all kind of work together as a community. And like when I was going over there in the early 2000s, yeah, the names of the contests have changed and the sponsorship money has gotten larger and there's other people involved besides these core organizers, but the core organizers are still involved. They still played such a huge part in getting Flatland where it is today in Japan. And they're all over there, boots on the ground, doing something at those events. So that's really the goal for the ABFL is, uh, you know, as this thing grows and, or even if it stays the same, to kind of keep all these guys involved because um, they've all played such a huge part uh, in Flatland here in the States in some way or another. Amazing. I like that. That's that's why I wanted to have the chat with you just to hear that because the press release thing is what's gone around everywhere and we see the schedule getting posted everywhere. I wanted to get like the real details behind all of it. That's really cool. Yeah, and lots of questions are coming through and as we're just now forming this thing, like we don't have all the answers right now. I think as, as each year goes on, we'll be able to kind of um, – refine this thing and make it tighter and tighter but um man even like as of right now we're just i don't want to use the word wing it but the main goal for this year was really just like dude let's put everyone together let's let's try to do something new and fresh let's give a, a little bit of a different feel uh, at each event that that it that it didn't have before and um and just kind of bring some structure to what's already there. Yeah, that's something I feel like we haven't fully seen a lot of in the BMX world with things is those individual stops. Like the USA BMX freestyle part is starting to do a little bit of that, but they're organizing the events. It's not already existing things that are a little bit different in their own ways. It's going to be really interesting to see how it all goes. Yeah, I mean, really... Um it would be rad to look back five years from now at this interview and go, man, that's, you know, maybe not exactly what I envisioned it to happen, but I think no matter what, if uh, we can look back three to five years from now at, at this interview and everything that I'm saying, and it's still going on and the ABFL is still around, then that's a win for a flatland here in the States. Uh, because what we really need um in my opinion is for there's a lot it is what it is there's a there's a lot of uh older guys in flatland here here in the states um it's just it's just kind of the reality of of what we're in right now is there's mm -hmm. not a lot of youth getting involved in flatland and um uh, the reasons for that could could vary you know um a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on that um <clears throat> But I think what we really need is these events to to look cool enough and to where if a younger kid walks in, they are like, man, I want to pick up a bike and I want to start riding some some flatland. I want to start doing some flat ground tricks, you know, even if they've never had a bike before or they have a street set up and they want to get in there and and see what they can do and start learning some things. So the flatland just so rad but it's also very complex and sometimes it's hard to understand and uh man it's hard to get started because uh the writing has changed so much over the years and the difficulty level is so high so to have a community and a series to where riders can look forward to and go to a website look it up see what's going on, see if there's a stop n near them that they can travel to. All this stuff um, can play a huge part in helping Flatland grow here in the States. Yeah, man. So I was going to ask you how you felt about the current state of Flatland, and we could hit on that in a second. But I actually had an idea that I felt like could help Flatland in general. And with the ABFL, it could be like a really cool thing. So are you familiar with these USA BMX freestyle contests that go on? Yeah. 
Yeah, for so sure. I had the thought, I was like, there should be like somebody who's a flatlander there at these events for the, the Friday before whatever, during the event, something or whatever in an area like or flatland so that there's and maybe get more people involved and have people riding flatland as like a thing that people can do when they're not riding or watching the contest. So it, it exposes this whole other group of people to it. Yeah, no, no, that's a, uh, that's a great idea. Or, yeah, and, uh, you're good. Sure. Uh, or just more BM, like freestyle jams in general or contests that happen having a flatland presence at them. Because every time I go to Cornhucket and there's a flatland jam there, there's always freestyle people involved. They're, they're trying flatland out, they're having fun with it. So I figure, like, if there was more of that crossover that happened, it would probably get a lot more people to realize one, they're already doing flatland tricks sometimes and, and two, yeah. that they can do it. Yeah, no, no, you're right. And if you think back to where flatland was the strongest in the U S it was when, you know, flatland was a part of like the UGP roots jam and, and Florida and when all the X trials were going on uh, here in the nineties and the early two thousands, you know, Flatland was always uh, a part of that series. So it was always something not only for the Flatland riders to look up to, but also for that crossover to happen to where maybe some of those guys that were just starting out riding BMX park kind of crossed over and started riding Flatland. So, um, that definitely helped. And what's really been a huge help worldwide recently is, you know, Flatland being a part of all these UCI events. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's been great. And to my knowledge, when Flatland is added to something like the UCI, it's in there forever. So that was mm -hmm. a huge news for Flatland that um, we're at all these UCI events um, around the world as well. Yeah, that's, I mean, exactly what I'm talking about that it could happen because we don't, you get a lot of those feast style events here in the U S I, mean, I don't know if we get any. So to have something over here that could be similar would be really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. If you think back to all the, the, the props DVDs, you know, that was so rad to have flatland mixed in mm -hmm. to pretty much almost every DVD at some point you saw a flatlander and, um, man, we didn't complain about that. We were just excited to be a, a part of those VHS tapes and, and DVDs. And that not only kept Flatland in the mix, but it kept new riders getting involved. And that also plays a part, like you're saying, and, and the crossover, it, it really helped out. Yeah, man. So, so we kind of talked a little bit about the current state, but like, if we were going to really focus on it, like, how do you feel about the current state of Flatland? Uh, worldwide, uh, I believe Flatland is, uh, it's, it's very strong. Uh, I mean, it, there's Flatlanders pretty much on every part of the globe and you can't deny that if you, right. if you start scrolling through Instagram, man, you're going to find riders in Costa Rica. You're going to find riders in Brazil, Portugal, you're going to find Flatland riders in Africa, Mexico. All, obviously all over Japan has the, the strongest scene. Um, if I had to guess, Japan could have in between 10 and 20,000 Flatlanders. Wow. Um, and they are just extremely on fire over there. And it's because of the, not only the series that they've done over the years, but they implemented like Flatland schools early mm -hmm. on. Um, and there's a little bit of that starting out here in the States. So we're a little bit late on it, but it's, it's happening. Uh, uh, Mari Kato is uh, one of uh, my team riders for the Majide brand that I run with Mickey Gaidos. And he's had a flatland school um, over the past couple of years um, that he was doing at his school, actually, because he's a school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, a guy, Kelly Baldwin, in Texas that's also doing a flatland school and bikes are being provided 
to these kids that show up. So I think we need a little bit of that, uh, more of that going on. But I think one of the first steps, though, is um, getting this solid series going to where if we can get a couple more little flatland schools popping up, then a couple of those students can start showing up to to some of these stops um, and and we'll figure out a way to help them get there as well. We just got to get it started. Yeah. And I mean, when you think about it, flatland should be easier to get like kids and people started with than a, a freestyle type thing, because all you really need is a good piece of ground to do it on. You don't in a bike. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. And, you know, I, I think it takes a certain type of personality sometimes as well. And, yeah. um, you know, it is what it is. A, a lot of times, uh, some of your best flatland riders, they, they ride alone, you know, and it almost takes someone that it takes an individual that's okay with kind of putting in that time by themselves. You know, because if, if you look at skateboarding or, you know, uh, even other disciplines at BMX, uh, man, it's it's a group thing. You know, you, you call on your homies, you're going out to ride with them. And that happens in Flatland as well. But real progression in Flatland is uh, is kind of done by, by behind closed doors by yourself uh, at your personal riding spot. And then you show up you know, once a month, once every couple of weeks, and you show that progression to your friends. So um, sometimes I think uh, after a, a rider gets interested in flatland, sometimes maybe interest may be lost when they, uh, when they realize that the community isn't as strong and riders to meet up with. But um, that's what we're trying to work on. And um, that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. I've had this talk with a few different people and just the saying like, well, you know, maybe if you want to get more people involved, you have your meetups at a skate park that has a nice piece of ground on it where you can have other people riding there and then like, Hey, try this. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, what flatlands definitely, uh, I feel like it's kind of that thing where like, it, we're 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 small uh, community, but worldwide we're so strong to where man, if we can spot a flatland rider from so far away, that there's no way that someone's gonna pass that rider up. And mm -hmm. skateboarding and some other disciplines of BMX, I mean, it's probably just pretty common to like pass up a rider, you know, but like oh, that's just a, another group of guys riding. That's just another group of guys skateboarding. But in Flatland, man, you, you seek them out. So um, mm -hmm. there's a, a lot of different personalities involved, uh, um, just a, a lot of different characters involved in, and we're accepting of, of everyone. And um, th that's been really cool to see over the years. Yeah, anytime I've ever been around Flatland and a group of people, it's always been an awesome vibe and just fun. Yeah, you're not going to see a ton of drama going around. We are just uh, extremely thankful to all be in the same space. Um, be because, like I said, a lot of times we, we do ride alone. So uh, a big crowd for us is is three riders, you know, mm -hmm. getting together for three, three guys. So then when you put us uh, 30, 60, 80 riders, um, they got together for a contest, it – it does turn into a little bit of a celebration of, of Flatland and getting everyone together and um, experiencing what Flatland has to offer um, collectively. And you guys are helping with that, with what you're doing with this ABFL, making that, trying to hone in on that. Yeah, and you know, over the past 25, 30 years, it's, it's been a lot about me, me, me. Uh, I just kind of want to show up and do my thing and leave of course i have my my friends there and and everyone that i love hanging out with but it's been very like competition oriented for me to where i just i didn't want to stray from that and now that i'm uh, getting a little bit older I, I am excited to to be a part of the abfl in a 
in a different way. I'm like, I'm not showing up there just as um, Terry that wants to do well and Terry that wants to be on, on the podium. I am showing up there with like my, I caught my eyes many times at contest in the U S kind of like looking at things that i wish that could be different. And, and, you know, uh, two or three years ago, I kind of hated that I was doing that because I'm like, Terry, you're not here to, to organize this person's contest. You're here to like, to ride, promote your sponsors and, and get the job done. But I'm now I'm kind of accepting it a little bit more that, you know what, maybe it kind of is my time to, to, to kind of say some opinions and, and offer some help or advice where I think uh, could make things a little bit better. Um, and in the past, maybe I was a bit, you know, didn't want to say things because I never want to offend people. But if, if you, if someone can come at something from a way of like, look, I'm just trying to help um, not only your event, but the state of Flatland, man, uh, it's better to, to speak your piece than, than not. Yeah. Things can't change if they don't get talked about. Yep. Yeah. So if you were to think five, 10 years into the future with everything you got going on and, and what you're trying to make happen, like what, what's your dream scenario to happen in, five, 10 years for all this with Flatland in general? Well, uh, the good news is, is we, we do have examples to look at. You know, we, we have like the Japanese riders and what they've created with the, the Flatland schools and with seeing their contest series go from this um, thing called the King of Ground, which is the KOG and and it was a very small grassroots series run by uh, a couple riders, which was super rad. Still, in my opinion, one of the best series that ever happened. Um, but now we had this example of what they were able to create with that KOG series, which is like, you know, now they have this, this contest called Flat Arc, which is it's huge, $100,000 you know, Jeez. a hundred thousand dollars just for the winter. Sometimes where like wow. flatland guys are, are walking away with a uh, hundred racks, That's you know, crazy. and this, um, other event called, uh, Chimera games or Chimera games. However you say it, mm. uh, it's an another series that happens in Japan, man, all this stuff was created from these like grassroots events. Yeah. And they were able to prove that, Flatland deserves to be in the spotlight. And that's really what I would like to see happen over the next five years is, uh, you know, to prove to everyone and to prove to uh, some of these larger corporations that Flatland deserves to be in the spotlight. And look, even if the ABL stays, the ABFL, but then it opens up some eyes for another contest to happen or another series to happen because we're able to prove that through our series, then that would be great. Um, because I would say the first 15 years of my career, I was very obsessed on making sure Flatland got what it deserved. Uh, I wanted so bad for the other sides of BMX and the BMX media that was around to show that, man, we deserve to be in the spotlight. We deserve to be on the cover of Ride BMX and BMX Plus, and we deserve to be on there because, um, man, we're, we're putting in a lot of time on these bikes, and when you, when you think about the roots of any BMX rider, it all started with some type of flatland. I mean, I'm sure... Your first trick, you know, wasn't on a ramp. I'm sure it was something on the flat ground. Rolling crank flip. There you go. Flatland enough for me, bro. Yeah, I'm bar hops. Yeah. Bar bar hops that I couldn't jump back from. But... Yeah, foot, foot jam tail whips, yep. I'm sure. Yep. There you go. Yeah, flatland, bro. So, um, for many years, I was... Um, uh, I dedicated a lot of time to... Calling up Ride BMX, you know, telling those guys up there, hey, how do you get a cover? Flatland hadn't been on the cover in, you know, 10 plus years. How, how do I make it happen? And uh, 
as I started to make those things happen for myself, I started to see different things happen as well to where other riders were then like, man, how'd you, how'd you get that cover? I don't know, man. I just, I had to do a little bit of extra work. I had to call the magazine. I asked for it. Sometimes I got told no, but with Flatland, you almost have to do a little bit of self-marketing and not feel bad about it. You know, um, maybe it's not as cool in other disciplines in BMX to be such a self-marketer, but man, uh, in those first years of me trying to put Flatland uh, in the spotlight, I just, I had to do that um, to get myself out there. And then I enjoyed doing it because every time something happened, wh whether it was me making the cover a ride or me making it on the props cover or getting Flatland on TV, every time I did it, I felt like it was like not just a win for myself, but it was a win for Flatland, you know, every time I was kind of like walking around just extremely hyped up that I that I didn't just do it for me. I kind of did it um, for the entire Flatland community. And I think it's time for for everyone to, to kind of start having that mindset again. Literally everyone, not even just Flatland, because it takes someone who has that 30,000 foot perspective of looking at it like that versus the internal, like, I'm doing this for me. I, I got the props cover. Amazing. Like, no, it's like, I'm doing this to try and get Flatland on another stage. I think that and having people that think like that is what can take things to the next level. When you talk about the ABFL and you guys are growing it and you're talking about larger corporations and getting them to get involved with Flatland, it's like, that is people thinking like that and not just thinking from where they're at down is yep. what it takes to do that. And and you talk about self promo and people think that's not cool, whatever. I can promise you any rider who has ever broken out of BMX and gotten involved with the larger culture of mainstream, whatever as a whole, they, they didn't necessarily maybe do it themselves because they had a agent, a publicist, somebody who is doing it for them, but it wasn't just, oh, I'm going to have, you know, a Slim Jim just hit me up randomly as a rider. Like, no, it takes the legwork of trying to break out beyond. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen for hardly anyone. Yeah. And you know, as a young kid, it just is what it is. I was like really obsessed with becoming a pro rider. Um, don't really know why. I think it was just because in those years that I first started riding Flatland, like Flatland was big in, uh, on the uh, on ESPN for the X Games. Uh, Flatland used to get a shit ton of TV coverage, man. Mm -hmm. So I, I would put those VHS tapes in and just record every time Flatland was on, which was which was quite a bit and it wasn't like two or three minutes of coverage. Sometimes it was 30, 45 minutes of Chad DeGroote, Trevor Meyer, Andrew Ferris, um, all these guys that like were getting this TV time. So I just, as a kid, I, be, I did kind of become obsessed with being sponsored and like trying to learn the business side of riding. So um, me being in Louisiana, how I did that was just always picking up the phone as a kid and I would go to pay phones, dial 1-800, ride a GT. Um, that's how I, I got Woody Itson on the phone and got one of my first, like, I guess, flow deals with GT bikes. And some of those first times I got in the magazine, it was probably because I was calling, you know, ride BMX as a young kid, just like aggravating the shit out of those guys. So by the time I did make, make way and was able to get to a contest, um, I, I already kind of had built a relationship with some of the photographers and people that worked for ride and plus, because I had been calling, you know, and, and that stuff, it, it helped me out in a lot of ways. Um, and it also gave me the confidence as a young kid to say like, man, like, uh, 10 people might tell me no, but maybe two people might tell me yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, since it worked so many times as a kid, I just kept doing it. So I just 
over the years, that's how um, I acquired new sponsors by just picking up the phone and calling and asking what I could do to make it possible. And there was years that I probably put down the bike 30 or 40 percent of the time to focus on the business side of riding. And it 100 percent hurt my progression. But I cannot uh, go back on those years and be bummed on myself for doing it because I did learn a lot and I did build a lot of relationships as well. Absolutely, man. I mean, that's what it takes. And I think what people have to realize is that it, it very, very rarely just happens. It takes that work and it takes picking up the phone. It takes sending that email, sending that direct message on Instagram. And, and what you have to realize is like when you're talking about like that, it's not this like, oh, I need to do this. And, you know, it's not this weird self like growing your head ego thing it's you realizing like that you have a goal and you want to make that goal happen and there's you just ha if you, it's not going to happen on its own yeah you're exactly right and man what's cool about all disciplines of bmx is man if you look at like traditional sports and it it was easy to get inspired because if you look at traditional sports and say like you're a, a kid that's a fan of basketball or football or baseball, man, you're never going to get to like go out on the floor and like talk to these players. Mm -hmm. But when I was showing up as a 10, 11, 12 year old kid, and I'm able to like walk up to the group and walk up to Trevor and Andrew and like talk to them. It's like, it, that was so inspiring as a kid and to know that like now all these years I've had that opportunity to like give back in a way, whether it's like picking up the phone for uh, someone that wants a, a advice on, on writing or how to get sponsored. That's been like amazing for me to do because all those times when I was like calling pro riders and writing letters to pro riders when I was a 12, 13 year old kid, I was calling like 20 year olds and 30 year olds. They didn't have to like pick up the phone and talk to me, but um, that's what's really rad about BMX is, uh, man, everyone's willing to help out and every, everyone wants to see the, the, the guys below you eventually come up and make something of themselves or, or can kind of see that, man, that person's going to do something for our sport in one way or another. So it's been great to kind of not only uh, take over that role a little bit over the past 10 or plus years, but just recently really start to enjoy that part of it. I think it's going to be vital to have someone who's conscious of all of the things that you are really pushing towards that because it's going to help you do that much better of a job of it and help that many more people. And that's exactly why I do podcasts with people like you <clears throat> because I want to ask these questions and have these conversations so that people can listen to them and hear that without even having to ask for it. It's just there. Yeah. And really it's like, it's all really about just not having shame, man. Not admitting that. I mean, not being afraid to admit that you don't know everything, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, that's still kind of the motto I use today is like, man, I just, if I don't know something, I just pick up the phone and ask them, or if I don't know how to get something done, I call someone else that, that might know. And I'm still doing that to this day, you know? So when someone calls me up with the courage to ask how I got what I got, whether it's a, a, a sponsor, a travel budget, an invitation to a contest, how I, did something with the bike company, bro. I'm really excited to like tell them not only what I've learned, but also the mistakes that I had maybe made along the way. Cause if I can help someone from making a mistake, um, then I'm going to definitely do it. So let's talk about that a little bit. Cause I feel like you probably have a really nice, really good perspective on the whole sponsorship thing that people could benefit from hearing. So when you think about, 
approaching a new company or a new sponsor or anything like that, or even the ones you have now, what's your mindset for how that relationship actually works? Man, um, I probably have a bit of an old school mentality on this, but I, I believe it's kind of helped me out over the years. Um, man, uh, I've always uh, worked with all the brands that that has wanted to support me. And I've always, always thought about it like a job. You know, I've always thought about it like I'm updating these guys on things that they probably don't even care about, you know? Hey, I'm going on a three day vacation with my family to Florida, you know? Um, hey, the, the tire's wearing out a, a, a little bit uh, weird on this part, uh, you know? But I, and hey, here's a, a Christmas card for you and your family. Um, hey, would you like to be a part of, uh, calling a brand up, would you like to be a part of this other thing that I have going on um, that has a little bit to do with uh, with this series or, or this show that I'm doing. And I've always just kind of approached it like, man, it's better that they hear from me than not hear from me if they're supporting me. So um, there was some, some years before it was really easy to send PDF updates. And I was sending binders like that thick to the brands that I rode for with local media, media from Ride and Plus. And I was sending recaps quarterly. And I was able to get that type of advice from guys that I really looked up to. You know, like when when I first started to get some of my first deals, I'm like, man, who who is doing this at a level that where they're making a, a good living and they're able to, you know, sustain it. So I, I called, uh, one of the first calls I made was Dave mirror when I was like super young and, um, man, he spent like 20 minutes on the phone with me and gave me a, a, a lot of good advice, which kind of revolves around everything that I'm telling you is like, in a nutshell, don't take it for granted because BMX is small and, you know, as long as you're not out there burning bridges and you're doing your job and you're showing them that you're working hard, then it's going to be really hard for them to get rid of you because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of guys that are that are overworking themselves to keep the deal. So um, there's been some years when the brands that I work for, I had to take salary cuts and but I was fine with that. You know, I. I believe I've been really good with riding that wave to where when the mm. brand's not doing as well, hey, that's fine with me. I, I still want to be a part of the brand. You guys have believed in me for many years. There's years when I don't have some of the best contest placings. You know, there's years when I'm not doing as much to promote the brand just because that's how things go. Or, you know, there's not as much going on or I can't make it to some places. So who am I to jump ship when a brand stuck with me for so many years? So, yeah. um, man, that's a, a big reason why I believe I've stuck with a lot of the brands and a lot of the brands have stuck with me over the years is that um, I, I really take a, a passion on like building a relationship that's like further than just um, signing a contract. You know, it's like, uh, the fact that some of these brands have spent sometimes 15, 20 years, like supporting me to live my dream. And I'm trying to do everything in my power to keep this dream alive. So I'm willing to still make a binder. I'm, I'm willing to tell, tell the brand something else that's working with another brand that, that worked really well for promotion. I'm doing everything in my power to ride this bike for a living and sometimes it does take putting down the bike for a day to get some of these things worked out but it's worked out for me in the long run and sorry for the long explanation but i'm just letting you go because it's all really good stuff and it's okay. it's perfect man i mean it people i think need to realize that 
when you ride for a company, it is way more than just riding your bike. And if all you do is ride your bike and post on Instagram, sometimes it's not going to last or be as fulfilling as it could be if you put in that work off of the bike too. Yeah. And thankfully I just, I fell in love with that side of it, you Mm -hmm. know, like just building those relationships and keeping those relationships strong um, it just meant a lot to me, and I just – whoever was in charge of signing that contract or um, writing up that contract for me, um, I always just let that person know how appreciative I was, first first and foremost, but then I also showed them as well. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm the first one to turn in what I need to turn in, you know, and um, I'm the first one – to pick up that phone and i end every call with every sponsor by saying the exact same thing is let me know if you need me i'm around yeah you know let me know if you need me i'm around and um and just i I don't know i think that goes a long way um especially when you mean it you know like i i mean i don't care man I, i got some of my sponsors that hit me up at five in the morning you know and i love that like, I absolutely love that because it's like, that's why I'm here. You know, I'm, I'm here to help help you guys just like you're helping me. And, uh, and to wake up every day and be able to, like, do tricks on my bike for a living for this many years. Dude, I'll, I'll go to bat for the, <laughs> for the people that that have, have helped me out. So Yeah, my my thing has become I'm happy to help. I'm here to help. That's yeah. That's what I I say to literally everyone because that's the truth. And when you when you make that conscious mindset shift to realizing that like you are there to help and do what you can for other people, is that's when you realize that that is how you actually be successful. And it's like you're here and you're genuinely wanting to help everyone you can, or it's your sponsors or whatever it is. The more you give, the more it ends up coming back later. Yeah, and look, over the years, uh, I've I've almost really taken a liking to, like, passing down that advice. And maybe it's sometimes I don't have the best advice, but if some rider or individual can take a little bit of what I've done to kind of help them in any way or, you know, whether it's – starting a new relationship or maintaining one of the ones that they already have, then uh, that's, that's been a a big win for me over the years. And I've kind of started to become uh, not okay, but almost like I've almost started to like fall in love with that part of my career, knowing that I'm, I'm 40 years old and yeah, I want to show up and I want to do well, but um, I think a lot of my legacy left behind won't be like, the the nor cups uh hopefully it's it's the the guys that i got on the phone with and had a 30 minute conversation because um when i think about with like guys like dave mira and woody itson and chad de groot and so many others did for me um man uh, if i can give that back in any way that's what i want to do yeah, man, and then the butterfly effect of all of that and how the, f- the things that happen because of those conversations that you would never even know about because it's removed by different stages of the ripples going out. Yeah. Yeah, so last thing about the sponsor thing. I mean, I see you're raising Kane's shirt. Do you work yeah. with them, I assume? Yeah, uh, I believe I'm going on year 17 with Raising Cane, so it's been quite a quite a relationship. All right, so think back to 17 years ago. Do you have a different approach to working with a company like that, or is there? Because I know through working with like larger companies, sometimes they care about different things, and and mm-hmm. and you have to present things in a different way. So, is it, have you found that with anything you've done? Yeah, I mean, obviously I've been in the game for a long time, so things change. Yeah. You know? uh, when when I got on Red Bull, Raising Canes, um, you know, Red Bull is over 20 years now, Raising Canes approaching 20 years. 
social media just wasn't a thing, you know, it just, it wasn't a thing, you know, like that's why I was sending those binders for updates. Um, but nowadays I do kind of have to factor that in, you know, I have to factor in that a lot of things are digital. A lot of, uh, a lot of the ads that companies are putting out are, I mean, they're pretty much all digital, you yeah. know, to be honest. So, um, man, it just, I think the way I approach it now is just knowing where the times are at, you know, um, as much as I hate to even admit it sometimes when I'm like going after a new sponsor and they start talking about influencers, I was getting like almost offended in the beginning because mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm like, I'm not a, like, why are they talking to me like influencer? Why are they in? I had to take a step back uh, and go, well, they're talking about it because it works. And mm -hmm. that's the era that we're in. So I kind of did have to adapt, even though I didn't uh, necessarily want to. I had to just take a step back and go, you know what? Maybe a, throwing out a promo code every now and then isn't a bad thing to try. You know, yeah. maybe, you know, making sure I'm extremely active with um, my engagement on socials isn't uh, a bad thing. It's it's just all where we're at right now. So, yeah. but you know, the, the great thing about it is, is if you're running your own social, which most people are, you can get so creative and choosing which lane you want to go down. So I've always just tried to be as authentic as possible. You know, I try to just put out the content that I know that isn't fake. And <clears throat> and for the most part, I feel like riders that follow me and any like potential customer for the brands that I work with um, can kind of feel that I'm being authentic, you know? Um, yeah. I, I really uh, try to shy away as much as I can from doing something that I don't believe in. So um, I, I think hopefully that answers your question. You know? It does. It definitely does. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I hate the word influencer, but yeah. when you're in this position, you have to recognize that that's just, it is what it is. And there's no, what I realized, like I hate the word influencer and I hate the word content so mm -hmm. much. But when you take that step back, you're like, well, what else do you call it? <laughs> like, there's not another word, really. Yeah, it was like really offending to me when it first came around because I would start talking to a new uh, brand new brand uh, that I was trying to start a relationship with. And they're like, oh, well, we're going to, you know, start you on, you know, or talk about this influencer program. And I would just, I would like, well, you know, that's not what I am. You know, I got like a, mm -hmm. got like a, this talent here where I'm, you know, I'm not just going to be promoting on social. I'm going to yeah. be, I'm going to be doing shows and demos. I'm going to be, you know, at these contests and some of it's going to be televised and social media is just going to be one little piece of my puzzle. Yeah. But, but then on their side, when they're looking at like numbers that some of the em uh, influencers and the money that it's actually bringing in for their company, yeah, I got to take a step back and go, I get it, you know? So yeah. m maybe me throwing out a promo code or being so heavy on social to promote some of these products might not be as effective as uh, as like a, an influencer that that's all they do. I can, still I can still add it in to something that I do. But like I said, I'm still very old school where – when I'm helping a, a brand write out a, a contract, I'm like adding in stuff like I'm going to run a sticker on my bike all year. I'm mm. going to hand out promo codes for the brand. I mean, I'm going to hand out promo cards for the brands that I work with that, you know, talk about why you and I partnered because I do like to have that like boots on the ground, old school style marketing because I feel like it's, it's really effective, you know, even if, I come across 10 people that I hand that promo card to. Um, I feel like, 
you're going to get a strong customer that might order something from that brand for 10 years because they remember that interaction. So, And then the word of mouth aspect that goes beyond that to the ripples that we keep talking about for sure is like, yeah, you might hit those 10 people and you're really hitting those 10 people. And then they're going to talk about it with 10 more people. And then it just keeps going from there. So like, yeah, the guerrilla marketing aspect of it is also very, very important. And it just, it does work. Yeah, it, it works. And I think it's, I don't know, it means something to the people that you come in contact with, you mm -hmm. know, um, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's going to create a, a short term customer by going the extra mile, you know, because we all know how easy it is to like, to make a post, you know, yeah. although it, it puts that product in, and it puts that company in front of a lot of eyeballs at one time, a lot of times you could just scroll past that product and and you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's great. He's he's talking about a brand <laughs> that he works for. But, um, yep. you know, like uh, a good example for me is uh, I've rode for Profile Racing now for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank, thanks to Chad DeGroote for really making that connection for me. Um, Profile has turned into like a family for me. And one thing that I enjoy doing and that I also find like extremely effective is, um, man, when I see all these people buying profile parts and uh, and they're posting them online, yeah, maybe I can't like come in contact with them, but then I send them a direct message and say, I, I think it's awesome that you, that you, that you purchased that hub because it's the same hub that I use and um, I'm riding those same cranks and uh, I've never had a problem with those things. And um, it's, it's awesome to get like direct feedback from some of those customers. And, and I, I enjoy it as well because um, I've, it's a product that I actually believe in, you know? Yeah, man, that's been one of my favorite parts of working with companies and doing the stuff I've done with YouTube is when, because I live by Rays, which is such a destination for so many people from everywhere, when I get to see people come out and like, oh, they're riding a part that I talked about. And they're like, hey, I bought this because I saw your video about it and I love it. And I'm like, dude, that's so awesome. And that's a really cool part of this thing that we do. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So I've been wanting to shout out a bunch of people who are watching right now. Cause there's a lot of really cool people watching. This might be a oh. good time for it. Uh, Claude Hickman is just entered Jerry Milborn's in here. Somebody named John Reyes with a check mark on YouTube. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey. Who? He's rolling. He's rolling on a, like a million subscribers, bro. You gotta check him out. Dang! Yeah. Pull some yeah. respect out my pockets. Throw it at yeah. that man. <laughs> uh, Mar Marley's in here. Mark McGray, Grind Legacy. Uh, who else is in here? A couple of the people who watch me on a regular basis. My buddy Jeff Mead, uh, Adam Ortiz. There was another one. Oh, Chad. Chad's in here. There you go. What up, Chad? The the one guy you were talking about, uh, Amari. Yep. He's in here. Lots Team of... Rider. Shout out Amari. Yes, we oh, that's where we gotta go next. We gotta talk about that because guess who I saw yesterday? Who'd you see? John Quartz. Come on, that's legit, bro. Yeah. Well I'm like, dude, I'm gonna talk to Terry tomorrow. <laughs> that's right. And when I did yeah. a podcast with John. I think he was working on your frames. That's rad. Yeah, they turned out so amazing, man. And we're so happy that we have them like frames in hand and uh, all our pre-customers pre are starting to get these uh, frames in the mail right now. So it's really cool to see. Yeah. Uh, so Maja Day. Maja Day, you said it perfect. Well, I asked John yesterday, <laughs> like, okay, gotcha. making sure I say this right. Because even he was like, when I first read it, I was like, I don't know how you say this. So what is that? Yeah, yeah. if you look it up, um, the Majide means like, really, for real in Japanese. Mm. So if you're around a bunch of Japanese uh, writers or individuals if you're ever in japan uh if you're ever around a bunch of japanese people you're going to hear that word quite a bit you know because they're just 
when they're ha- when they're conversating back and forth, they're gonna be going majide, yeah. majide, and it it just means really for real, and uh, that was one of the first words that I learned on my first trip to Japan in two thousand two, because um, mm. it was very easy to say, and I was hearing every right every Japanese writer say it to another writer, so. Um, over the years, it's almost been my way of letting Japanese writers that maybe don't speak the the greatest English to let them know that I understand what they're talking about. You know, sometimes they're trying to explain something to me in English, and I'll respond to them, majide, mm. and, and they kind of get it. So, um and it just it really rolled off the tongue so uh that's why we we landed on that name that's so sick real quick uh nate wessel oki chin chin that's what he just said <laughs> <laughs> what up, nate? hell yeah nate i need you to get on here sometime too uh but yeah i was talking to john about it you start in a frame company um what's what else beyond the name i mean the fact that you have so much thought into the name itself you gotta have just as much in everything else right yeah, I mean, really, this came about, um, honestly, because over the years uh, of riding for all these brands, I guess, I went from GT to two hip bikes uh, to Aries bikes in Japan, gave me support for many, many years, like, I guess, like, 02 to 2008. Then I did the signature frames with Odyssey. That went on for a long time like oh nine to like 2013 and then i wrote for chad uh deco and i'm still supporting deco i'm still doing signature parts with chad but and so many riders had support i'm um, so many riders that riders that own brands supported me and just brands supported me over the years it was really the one thing in my career that i hadn't felt which was giving back to BMX in that way. And uh, I figured it was like time to do that. So um, my best friend, Mickey Guido said, you know, got back into riding like at a, at the end of like 2018 and him and I have just been on this like journey together of just riding as much as we can and progressing as much as we could together. And, um, Man, I just got to thinking one day, man, uh, wouldn't it be rad to do something with my best friend that I'm kind of sharing all this together with? And we were putting a lot of our content out on social, and I we could feel that other riders were kind of feeling the energy that we were putting out, which was mm. just like, man, we were just trying to inspire and motivate other riders by what we were doing, which was really just came down to riding an absurd amount and trying to progress a lot and um, just trying to put out as much good energy as, as we could to show like, man, we're not the youngest guys out there, but we like are trying to like not slow down here. We're trying to show you guys that we're, we're pushing like as hard as we can physically and mentally on these bikes. So Mm. I had a conversation with Nikki and if he wanted to like, you know, start a brand with me. And it was a great opportunity for me to, to present that to Nikki because um, he's the one that introduced Flatland to me uh, in the nineties. It was like 1994, 1995. He, um, I was, I had started off racing BMX and uh, rode like park and rode skate parks and did shows on box jumps as a little kid. And when Mickey came down to meet me, he was already like hardcore flatland. So the day I met him, it kind of pretty much changed my trajectory in life because I just had became so obsessed with flatland riding and the culture behind it and how it just really, it really suited my personality. So um, as a kid, my goal really was to show Nikki um, that uh, that I was a real rider and sh- and just kind of prove to him that um, I I wanted to to be a great flatland rider. So over the years, even though he had stopped riding, I, I still just always just 
never forgot that that he's a huge reason so then when he came back in the riding i'm like and we got to do something together so that's really what we've been focused on is all the content that we put out is man um showing people that we're out there creating we're trying to bring a, a fresh vibe to to flatland bmx and and then hoping to inspire and, and motivate people um with with what we have going on with maja day and um we're so psyched man we're psyched that we landed uh on john courts he's had such an amazing job bro we feel like he's got his like laboratory over there mm -hmm. where he's like building these ex ex very detailed extreme custom frames and uh they, they just turned out so nice the, the attention to detail so is there a specific model that you're starting with yeah i mean it's right now it's just it's just one model, just the Majide frame, and we offered some like custom sizes to mm -hmm. our pre-order customers, and then on FlatlandFuel.com right now, you can see the other si the sizes that we have in stock. Um, but you know, like I said, that was kind of the goal was to like feel what feel what I felt all those years of like these brands that wanted to help me out. So mm -hmm. we started off and we. Uh, uh, sponsored uh, Amari uh, Kato, which is you said was uh, was in the live right now, and, mm -hmm. and Amari is like an extremely talented uh, rider from Texas, um, and he actually came up riding like one of his first contests or first contest was the Voodoo Jam. So we've actually got to see this this guy come up from like a beginner rider to now um, a a high level pro rider and uh it was like a perfect fit for Majide since we had kind of seen his progression and um he he's also one of the guys that's uh out there doing the flatland schools um you know helping flatland grow here in the states and our plan is this year we're already talking to uh, another rider um we don't want to announce the news yet but we're we're stoked to feel that once again to where um to just give back in any way we can so obviously right now we're small but we're helping these guys out as, as much as we can so hell yeah is uh the geometry of that frame is that something that you were specific on like that you want to that people would hear it and be like oh i like that if you talked about it yeah i mean i guess the way to put it is like anyone getting into flatland that they don't understand the differences between uh, flatland geometry and like a geometry on just like a, a bike that someone's riding park or street on. Mm -hmm. It's just everything's tighter, you mm -hmm. know. The the back end's a little bit shorter. That the head tube angle is a, a little bit steeper, you know. We have a top tube that's an eighteen point nine, you wow. know. So. When you see a lot of these guys and you wonder, like, man, how are they getting around the bike like that? That's mm -hmm. how they're. That's how we're moving the around the bike like that is because the geometry on these things are like to help you, you know. Right. Um, and that's important. So, um, my advice would be anyone that's like looking to get into flatland is like. You know, we, we realize that a, a lot of these guys are running like a longer top tube right now and a longer rear end. So maybe maybe pick go on flatlandfuel.com and look at one that's not as an extreme as such an extreme change for what you're already riding. So what are the numbers like? What's the rear end normally on or even on your frame? Yeah, that's a good question, bro. We'd have to we have to pull it up. Oh, I can do that. Uh, Flatland yeah, fuel. Pull it up. Yeah, Flatland Fuel, maybe pull them up. And on the main page right now, just because I don't want to miss anything here. Right on the front page. Yeah. Nice. And right now, I'm running a 19.5. Okay, so... Top two. Gotta figure out how to go up here. Uh, there we go. All right, 75 degree head tube, 71 seat. Those are both somewhat normal. 13.25 chain stay, seven inch standover, 14 dropouts, 11.85 bottom bracket height. I feel like that's pretty high. You like that? Yeah. That's good for flatland. Okay. Yeah. With or without brake mounts, mid bottom bracket, and dang, they're light. 
19 or yeah. 19 five and they're coming in at 4.25 or 4.3 pounds shoot yeah I like that yeah man. and i i believe he was able to get them so light because of the diameter of the the tubing you know mm -hmm. i got you you know the, the quality of the tubing obviously was great as well but the diameter of the tubing is uh is i think what played into that weight factor yeah i mean you're not grinding on rails and doing stuff like that so you don't have to worry about quite as much with it yeah and and i know when you kind of stumped me a minute ago on the sizes the reason why i kind of had that response is i didn't want to misquote any of the sizes because mm -hmm. if i'm being honest here i feel like i can like I, over the years it's like I, I haven't paid too much attention to those things you know i i feel like if you gave me like a Hoffman Condor, uh, like long frame or some kind of like crazy frame, um, I would probably, you know, fall in love with it. So, um, although I, I know the, the angles and everything, uh, is a huge help all in all when you're riding flatland, it's about putting in the hours and, and you'll figure out the geometry. So, but as far as new riders getting involved in flatland, I think it's important to not pick something so extreme. That's why we did offer the the 19.5 and um, even a 20.5, I believe. Pat might not have any of those available. Is that listed? Uh, not yet. I just see 19 okay. and 19.5 currently. Gotcha. So, yeah, man, that uh, is it raspberry. Yeah, raspberry pink. That color is nice. Yeah, it's got some sparkle to it, bro. Is that the one you're riding? That's the one I'm riding. I, yep. I see why. I like, so I, I don't normally think a lot about graphics on frames. I just kind of look at something and go, oh, that's cool. But I, I like how much of that down tube is the graphic. Yeah. Um, Travis, are you familiar with Travis Collier? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, yeah, man, Travis uh, was pretty much our creative director on everything branding and we were going for almost like I don't want to call it like a sporty feel but like almost like that NASCAR vibe where like everything is like big and in your face because um, man that's what we're stoked on right now we're Mickey and I are uh, extremely excited about competing right now we're extremely excited just about you know big in your face logos and and it we kind of wanted that like nascar style like vibe to be kind of pop in your face you know um nice. so we, we we're really stoked on how it came out hell yeah man i'm so pumped for john and everything he's doing and all the people he's making bikes for yeah bro when we reached out i knew like immediately i'm like oh this is this is the guy we we want to use just because when you when you start talking to someone that has that much passion behind what they're and passions like coming first and like it wasn't about the money it wasn't about how much he was going to make it was more about like he wanted to talk about the details of these frames and you know the strength behind the frames and um the the quality of them then we got off the phone and we're like yeah man i i feel like we should just call him back right now and tell him he's got the job so <laughs> that's super cool man i'm pumped for that I just seeing him yesterday and just you can just see the passion he has for what he does i was going to use that exact word when you brought it up yeah hell yeah um so you talked a little bit about you know how long you've been riding for and being professional for as long as you have i was kind of curious and i feel like I already know the answer to this, but like, is there things that you've done specifically to try and like prolong BMX for you and set yourself up to keep going as long as you can? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> there was definitely uh, a few years where like I wasn't doing that, you know? And, and when I wasn't uh, paying attention to those little details, uh, I started to feel like uh, I was going down with my level of riding, mm -hmm. my progression, um, my health and fitness, because I wasn't paying attention to these little details. Um, and then I would say 
A little bit over five years ago when my son was born, I just woke up one day and said, man, I always preach about like not taking riding for granted and not taking this life for granted that I have of like making a living from riding. And I just had to look at myself in the mirror and say, man, I'm, I'm definitely not on a trajectory or even staying level with uh, my riding, my progression and, and where I'm just, where I'm going right now. So after looking at myself in the mirror, um, you know, physically and mentally, I just, um, I guess I was in a, I was in a valley, you know, in a career this long, there's like peaks and valleys. And if I'm being honest with myself and everyone, I was, I was definitely, you know, um, not at my best. Yeah. So with that said, I, I, I really started paying attention to, um, my diet. Um, I probably, I probably had, uh, an extra 15 pounds on me, 10 to 15 pounds that I, my ego was kind of in the way I didn't realize that it was affecting me, but every, every little bit hurts you. And, um, that little bit of, uh, extra fat that I had on my body, um, also contributed to not having a whole lot of muscle. So it just made me a little bit slower and a little bit weaker. So, um, immediately I kind of put a plan into place to help me lose that weight, but also gain some strength. Um, I had built a, a basically a, a diet uh, for myself and also a uh, like a workout program for myself, but I was like running myself ragged with my obsessive personality. So <laughs> thankfully Red Bull stepped in and, and really helped me with some variety in the foods that I was eating to make sure I was just eating the proper stuff to keep me going and giving me the proper energy levels that I needed to, um, that I needed to ride the amount of hours that I was riding. And then, um, they, they have a, a program up there called the APC, which is the athlete performance center. And that's who stepped in to help me. The strength and conditioning coach stepped, stepped in and, uh, not only gave me the proper workouts, but, also made sure I was taking rest and recovery days and all those little things I just didn't think about. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't think about them in my twenties and, and my early thirties. And it is what it is. It's something that like you have to think about if you, if you want to ride a bike at uh, a high level, um, or you want to do any sport at a high level, you just, you have to think about those little details. So, um, I would say right now, uh, where I'm at, the magic sauce is like paying attention to like my sleep, the things that I'm putting in my body. And then, um, a huge thing that helped me is, it's been meditation uh, mm -hmm. over the past five years. I just, um, it's kind of helped me stay locked in as well as it's, it's kind of helped me realize some things that, you know, maybe I didn't want to admit to myself either, you know? So what does meditation look like for you? Like how you, uh, if someone was not doing that at all, what, what does it even look like? Yeah, really, man. Um, it's just breathing and it's just the practice of being present. Mm. Um, uh, you know, now I, I meditate on like a meditation pad for, you know, the past four years. But that first year, I just sat in a chair just like this and put my hands on my knees and closed my eyes and and started breathing uh, with my eyes shut. Um, and and you just take a, a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And the reason I started that process is because I wanted to be like a better contest rider. I wanted to. I was focusing on that breath to keep me extremely present. And that three minute contest run, I was basically practicing that meditation in the beginning of, I guess, my resurgence to writing in contest because I wanted to be more focused and not have my mind wander. So if me going that practice of going back to that breath mm -hmm. um, was really helping that process of me in contest. But over the years, the meditation kind of turned into something else. It, it kind of 
turned into not only a practice that helped me be present in contests, but really be more present in life as a, a husband, uh, a father to my son, um, not only at contests, but while I'm training. And it just helped me kind of honestly just be more happy and more grateful because if you're more kind of like grateful and even if it's like you're just having a conversation with your friend or a family member and and you can kind of be more locked into that conversation, um, I feel like the practice I've done with sitting there breathing is uh, it's definitely been a, a part of not only where I'm at on my bike, but just my level of happiness right now. Yeah. That's some good insight right there. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Do you do any kind of like exercise and things? As far as just in general, you do an exercise beyond riding. Oh yeah. I, yeah. When I was saying workouts, I, um, man, I, I wake up at 3.30 every morning, which is a little early, but <laughs> I, I do a 15 to 25 minute meditation. Um, and then I do strength training um, right after that meditation on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do like a core workout, um, which is more like, you know, um, core and conditioning, um, which, you know, it it plays a, a huge part in flatland um, just because if you have a strong core, you can kind of stay more balanced. So um, yeah. So five days a week I'm, I'm doing those workouts and seven, six days a week I'm doing the meditation and um, uh, I finish up the, the workouts around five thirty AM. And then after breakfast, I'm, I'm riding my bike by eight thirty. So nice. All right. So if there was, one specific exercise that you feel like or working out is like part of you that helps riding the most what would you say that is you know i could try to overcomplicate things and just you know obviously i'm trying to work all these little parts on my body mm. just because i'm i'm five years in but man just push-ups and sit-ups you know mm. Push-ups, sit-ups, and pull-ups um, can give everyone some 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 strength and and also help them get in shape. And as far as uh, I can overcomplicate things and say, if you want to lose some weight, you got to do this, this, and that. But it comes down to you you got to move that body. So whether you're you're walking or or, or running a, a a mile and just kind of conditioning yourself to to build up more and more, that's where it starts. It's just you know, wanting to, to get a little bit stronger. Hmm. Do you do any kind of supplements or vitamins? Yeah, I do. But honestly, what I focus on most is, um, just not, not eating a lot of bad shit, you know, yes. um, because be, when I was kind of really in that, in that valley in my career where I wasn't paying attention to things and I was just eating whatever. And that was fine in my, in my teens, my twenties, my early thirties, but in my mid thirties, uh, it was, it definitely wasn't working out the same. You know, I, I definitely felt a little more sluggish with all the stuff I was putting in my body. So, um, yeah, dude, sugar is the worst thing ever. And what you don't know it or realize it until you go without it for a little while and then have it again. Yeah. Yeah, but really, man, just appreciating the times that I do get to eat a little bad is kind of what's helped me stay locked in, you know. So yeah, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very adamant about the cheat night on on Friday nights, and um, I kind of look forward to that every week. And um, Friday comes around, you know, <laughs> every seven days, so it, it, it'll be coming. <laughs> I use uh riding as a little bit of a cheat sometimes where it's like if i'm in the middle of a session or just finished riding it's like okay i have a little bit of something because my body right now is just going through everything that's in there yeah no i feel you so i had a little bit of a thought here because this topic is something that's perfect for something else i'm working on i'm planning something i'm going to call bmx health week on my okay. youtube channel where i'm going to do videos with different people hopefully talking about 
stuff to do with the health type things like talking about eating working out all this stuff and and i feel like you're a perfect person to talk to so maybe this next thing could be like a segment i clip for a future video but okay i'd be curious to hear with everything you've learned you've been doing this for five years if you were talking to someone who is at day zero what are you going to tell that person who's like there actively trying to listen and they want to help themselves. What are you telling them? Well, um, my first piece of advice is to like, not say you're going to start on Monday, <laughs> you know, or, or, or the following week. Um, because, uh, I've talked to so many different people that kind of want to get started. And a lot of them say that they're going to start, um, on Monday, or they're going to start after this certain event, or they're going to start, you know, watching what they eat after this particular wedding or this thing that their friend has going on. I mean, the, and you can only imagine, I mean, yep. just are just kind of waiting to get started. Um, I think what really helped out with me is um, that day I told you, I looked in the mirror. I, I didn't know what I needed to do to, to start the process. I just knew I needed to do something. Mm -hmm. So I, I put on my shirt and I started running that very day. And it was kind of, I think that would be my word of advice is like, look, there's just so much stuff online. Like, yeah, I have Red Bull helping me out with the, with the workouts and the nutrition, but there's so much stuff online. Yeah. There's so many people that, online that can give you some uh some workouts that are 20 minutes 40 minutes and uh, that you can do five days a week and i think that would be another word of advice is you don't need to do two hours or three hours i think as long as you're getting 30 to 40 minutes five days a week however you spread it out you, you're gonna you're gonna start to feel better physically and mentally if you can do that for yourself um and it, it's not rocket science you said it a minute ago i mean mm. if you're if you're putting a a, a ton of crap in your body a, a, a ton of sugar i mean you're, you're gonna feel it but if you're putting things in your body that come from the earth um you're going to, you're going to feel some really great benefits. You're going to start to get like the actual energy that you need. Yeah. And that was the main thing that I realized when I started like really eating right is I felt like I had sounds crazy, but I felt like I had superpowers because I had never eaten like that. Even as a teenager or in my twenties, I never, I never ate like that. I never like ate fruits and vegetables consistently uh, to where I would be able to like actually feel a difference and the, the way I felt and the energy levels that I had, but my energy levels just shot up um, after a few weeks. And it's kind of like you don't get locked in until you actually feel the difference for yourself. I can tell all your listeners a million times that it, it's going to make you feel better and it made me feel better, but not until they stay locked in to those two or three weeks and start feeling those effects. Will they then step outside of that box that they might be in? So it sounds to me like even more importantly than thinking about working out or eating better or anything like that is that you have to make a conscious mindset shift before anything for real can start to happen yeah and it's kind of like you, you'll know when you know because uh when it really clicks it'll click you know and you gotta really be ready you know um but when when that thought comes into your head you know that, that you want to make that change in your life because like i said at first it started out as like i wanted to get in better shape for riding and i mm. wanted to to eat better, to like, to, to, you know, to get in shape. But then it kind of turned into like, like everyone will probably tell you it turned into more of a lifestyle, you know, because, because of the way it made me feel it kind of, 
I mean, honestly, it means just as much to me as riding does, you know, because it's, mm. that's what's going to keep me riding at this level and, and keep me happy and, and sane as well. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that it had something to do with the birth of your son too, in that I think that might've been part of your mindset shift. So, so is it a thing of like, maybe somebody has to find that thing that helps them make the shift in their mind? Yeah. And, you know, I had people telling me too. you know, I had, um, I had hired Marty Quopa as my riding coach because he started like coaching riders, uh, around the world. And I had signed up for his program because it was something different and something that keep me motivated. There's all these UCI events going on. So immediately five years ago, when I decided to get back into riding, I hired Marty to kind of help me with the way I rode and the way I train and how to just approach contests, um, which he's the one that helped me uh, get started in meditation. Thank you, Marty. But one of the things that he said was like, man, you really need to, you could probably afford to lose like a, a good 10 pounds. He's like, not a ton, but he's like, I looked at some videos of you in the early 2000s and you were just quicker and you were, you were snappier on the bike and you had more speed and, my ego was in the way at that point and i was just like i wasn't having it you know i just was like yeah I, in my mind when he told me that i was i was kind of responding with bro i'm riding the best i ever have like <laughs> don't don't try to tell me i need to eat better or that i'm not strong like that's what i thought um and then what actually happened um besides my son being born and being a part of the process was i stepped off the bike uh, on a trick and like I felt something in my back like tighten up mm -hmm. and I was just about to go to China for a UCI contest over there and so I had to go to China with my back a little bit tight for me stepping off the bike well when I went and talked to a physical therapist here in my town one of the first things they said um, was and if your core was a little bit stronger uh, I think that could pre could have prevented that back injury. So that's when it kind of clicked for me is like, ah, uh, you know, I'm like, Marty was probably right here. Like my core just wasn't strong enough to support me at that time, the way I stepped off the bike. So it was an eye opener for me to where like, man, uh, maybe having a strong core and being in shape isn't going to prevent every little mishap that happens. But um, it can definitely be in it can definitely be a contributing factor on why I'm not like a hundred percent right now. You know, makes sense. I feel like this will be a really good segment for the beginning of what I do with this BMX Help Week because it's like a it's like a primer for it. So it sounds like to summarize, like you you don't start on Monday. You start right now. <laughs> yeah, you gotta find your your why your mindset shift. And, mm -hmm. and then uh, just being conscious of what you're putting into your body as your fuel, kind of. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And then exactly. how does meditation fit into w what we just talked about? I mean, the way I can explain meditation to a lot of people that just they, they don't understand, um, the simplest way to put it is um, – you know, when you're working out, you're working out like your muscles, right? You're working out. Well, there's uh, there's pieces in your brain that you can work out too. Mm. You know, so you're kind of like uh, you're working out those little muscles that uh, every time you're practicing breathing, that muscle is growing a little bit. So just like your muscles grow in your forearms and your legs. Um, you're building up that mental strength of staying present. So as a good example, um, if you're sitting there breathing, right, and you're focusing on your breath and your mind starts wondering about this podcast I have to do tomorrow with Terry or, and I wonder how that podcast went with Sean. It was a little crazy, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you're, every time you start to think about either the past or the present and you go back to breathing, 
that's practicing being present. So mm. it doesn't matter how many times your brain wonders, as long as you're coming back to that breath work, you're building that, that muscle that can help you stay present in other areas in your life. So hopefully that was a, a way to where people can understand it, you know? Yes, absolutely. So I, I hope that that's a really good primer for everybody for whatever I do with this BMX health week. And, uh, yeah, that was fun to talk about that quick topic. So I actually think that this meditation thing might help me because there's a lot of times when I'm riding, it's my, I can't turn my brain off ever. Like my brain yeah. does not ever just sit there and think about nothing. It's constant mind thoughts racing about everything. And there's times when I'm riding where I will be having a full out scenario mental situation like going on where i'm thinking about 50 other things as i'm rolling at a trick and by the time i get to the end, i'm like no stop <laughs> yeah you get hurt like that yeah. yeah yeah well luckily i'm like present enough to be like okay we're just not even gonna follow through with this attempt but i think doing some of that thinking and then coming back to the moment letting the brain wander and coming back will help and i mean it probably is a little bit of meditation when I'm riding and I do force myself to come back to the moment to do what I'm doing. Yeah. And look, man, if you ever want to talk about some simple things you can do and if you want to call me and I dude, I'm, I'm an open book. Like I say, I, I love, uh, teaching people what I've learned over the years with meditation and, um, man, not to harp on it too much, but the, the main thing is just staying consistent with it. It's kind of like, it's kind of like working out, you know, like if someone goes and only works out for a week, they're going to get kind of bummed if they don't see results. It's kind of the same thing with meditation. Like the guy that's been meditating three months is going to have better results than someone that's been do doing it consistently a week. But like someone that's been doing it 10 years is going to have way more results than I'm having right now at five years. So it's kind of like the, the more consistent you do it, the more you start to feel those effects that it's helping you. Um, and it's, it's just different because you can't see it with working out. You, you start to see your body change, but you can't really see your brain being able to be more present, but you start to feel it in due time. That makes sense. Um, yeah. And just for anyone who's watching, I have no, I think putting a thumbs up with tip. I think you putting a thumbs up earlier made a thumbs up show up on the screen. That was not me. <laughs> I didn't, uh, I'm not putting effects on there to get people to do thumbs up on the videos. <laughs> and that's a Skype thing. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so there was actually just a couple more things I wanted to talk about after seeing your background. I'm kind of curious. One, is that a painting behind you on the wall? Yeah, that's uh, um, the that's a painting. Yeah. Uh, wait. You're talking about right here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, some guy reached out to me on Facebook. His name is Chuck. And he, like, paints uh, photos of, like, um, NFL players, I believe, like college uh, football players and uh, here in Louisiana. And he reached out and said, can I draw a picture of you? And that was, like, the last photo that I had in my phone. It was a nice photo when he reached out on Facebook, and that's a photo of me riding at the uh, X Games in Japan like two years ago. So I just sent that, and then three weeks later, that showed up in the mail. It's really cool. This is a good, keep a good job. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I was just curious about that when I saw it in your background. I'm like, oh man, that's really cool. I wonder what the story is there. And then. Uh, talking about meditation and all of these things, I noticed your vision board. I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts. I mean, obviously it wouldn't be there if you didn't feel like it helped you. Yeah. Um, honestly, uh, the interesting thing is, uh, the reason there's two vision boards is because the first vision board that I have on the bottom, I created it, uh, I guess. Uh, and I guess that would be 2016 and everything came true on it. Oh, wow. Uh, that pretty much everything in some way or another came true. So I, I was able to kind of like go and put like check, check, check. Yeah. Um, and so 
sometimes I take that off the wall and uh, I've went and spoke a couple times, whether it be at schools or my, my friend has a real estate office and I, I bring the vision board where everything came true and I kind of walk them through some of, some of the things that I thought was pretty interesting um, because it's, uh, it's wild to think about, man, that if you can put stuff on a board, it, it can come true. And I'm not suggesting that any of that stuff was magic because there's no, there's no magic involved. It's just, you know, when I'm walking into my office every day and I'm seeing some of my goals in a picture form, it keeps that stuff really fresh in my mind mm -hmm. um, to where – I, I, I think it's helped me over the years, you know, that uh, I'm looking at the new vision board and I don't know when I put it on there, but it says start a company with Nikki dream big. And it's <laughs> the day that the day that we had the, the idea to do Maja day, I, I went and like printed out a picture of a frame and then a picture of Mickey and I standing on my backyard spot. Cause that's like the day we decided we were going to do it. And, you know, now we're, two years later and there's the you know frames getting delivered at at all these riders houses so little things like that to kind of look back on i need to go back and, and put a check on that so that's so cool that's and it's yeah like you said it's not magic it's you putting it on there and then keeping it fresh in your mind and when something's fresh in your mind that's when you put the energy towards taking it from being on the board to being real yeah, I put a picture on the old board. I put a picture of a Red Bull can, and then I put 20 years because I was at 16 or 17 years, and mm. I, I wanted to make it to, to 20 years. And it was it was a reminder to me to to not let up, you know. Um, so uh, when my son was born, it's like I got my son here reminding me that I, I need to stay grateful to keep this life going. And then every time I walked in my office, I'm like, I did put, I did put 20 years by that Red Bull can. Like, I, I, it's, it's time to get out of this valley and, and do what I need to do to, um, to, to make the 20 years. So little things like that, man, it, it's, it's really helped me. That's, and I think that's the kind of thing just talking about that can help other people because somebody might be in a funk themselves and be like, how do I get out of this? And just making that that vision board, or at least like thinking about that could, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, I stand by them, man. I stand by them just because like I say, to have that many things on a board that came true, uh, it, there's gotta be something to it, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I think it's just because even though I'm not going and like staring at it every day, when I walk past it every day, cause I, I come and sit in this chair every day and mm. I just, I kind of see it every single day. I'm actually seeing one of these things that I, that I put down, you know, um, I'm looking at the old board right now. I put that I wanted a hundred K followers on Instagram, but I, I put that in like 2016. And then, uh, ironically one day Snoop Dogg posted one of my videos. It, it, it brought me from, you know, well, probably a, a lot of those followers aren't even active anymore. Who knows? But it brought me from that like 60, 70 to a hundred. And wow. yeah, I'm not saying it happened because I had it on the board, but it definitely allowed me to like, let's say if uh, that post would have only brought me to 80, it would have kept me motivated mm -hmm. to know that I'm only 20 away, you know? Yeah. Damn. Snoop Dogg on Snoop Dogg's Instagram. Yeah, like a, a good example would be, um, I watched this, uh, I watched that DVD, The Secret, many, many years ago, that's kind of about bringing things to fruition by, by thinking positive and kind of doing vision boards. And they had a guy on there that said he had a goal for his company to make a $100,000. So he, he took like a $10 bill, because that's what he had at the time. And he made it into a, a hundred thousand dollar bill and he put it above his bed. Well, at the end of the year, he ended up at 90 K mm. and he said like, was I bummed that I made 90 K? He's like, no, I was, I was stoked that I was so close to a hundred. 
So it's kind of like having that reminder every day that like, man, I know these are some big goals, but this is, this is what I want to do. And this is what I want to accomplish. So, um, and you just never know how close you are to that goal. Right. Like yeah. you could be like, you know, there's that photo of a guy yep. like dig, digging in the cave and like a lot of people just turn around right before it happens, you know? Yep. Let me pull that up. What is it? A uh, diamond meme. Boom. Right there. First thing that comes up uh, right here. I know you won't be able to see it, but it's there for everybody else nice the the guy with the pickaxe right in front of all the diamonds who's turned around going the other way and then the guy who's close who's like frantically going after it that's real yeah i mean and who knows I, that could have happened to me many times in my life where i just like kind of stopped and could have kept going and um so i don't know i think that's a good metaphor yeah man so what is what does you think the next year five years look like for you um I, honestly man i'm just i'm really stoked where i'm at right now uh in life and with writing and um i um like i like i was telling you earlier uh my goals were really like uh i don't know like i i had this goal of being like uh, the best I could be, uh, five years ago, but it was really kind of based on like, I just wanted to like win contests, win contests. I just wanted to like be back at the top again. And over this past five years of like working on myself, that being the best I could be really turned into something else. You know, it turned into, um, being the best I can be for my family doing the best, being the best I could be for my community uh, in VMX and Flatland, um, being the best friend I could be to, to Mickey and all my other friends. And uh, so it, those goals kind of changed, you know. Of course, I still want to show up to the contest and, and do well. Of course, I still want to be in shape, but more so I just want to, like, maintain this level of, of happiness and um, giving back through, you know, maybe helping with the, the contest series, um, you know, doing stuff with Majide. Then it, it puts me showing up to these events and being a part of BMX, not so focused on one thing, which was just me, me, me. Now it can kind of be like, and I'm, I'm here for more reasons than one, you know? Absolutely. Wow, that's so cool. Just like the, a lot of people talk about the, the most professional people in BMX. I feel like a lot of people probably have no idea that you are very close, if not at the top of that list, man. Dude, I, I greatly <laughs> uh, appreciate that. Um, I don't see myself as that, but if you do, I, I, I don't know. Hey, I appreciate it. I'm not going to force you to take that compliment. <laughs> 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 it's just, yeah, it's awesome to hear. I mean, you're super grounded and you recognize all the things around you and that it takes work to keep this stuff alive. And it's not just given to you and not, you're not taking anything for granted. And I, it's nice to hear that from people. Dude, I, I greatly appreciate that. And like I say, if, if anyone took anything away from anything that I said, I'm, I'm stoked. Yeah. Stoked so I don't want to take your whole day. So uh, I guess if you wanted to talk about any of this stuff and where people could find it that you've got going on. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, with the... the the ABFL American BMX Flatland League. That's it's that's the website. The American BMX Flatland League. Yep. Um, if if any changes happen to the league, if anything is uh, uh, any news updates, it would be posted on on there as well as the Instagram. Um, uh, the Majide bikes that we were talking about, they're at flatlandfuel.com. Mm -hmm. um, my social channels are Terry Adams BMX. Um, and that's pretty much it, man. Um, it's pretty easy to get in touch with me if uh, 
if anyone out there sends me a direct message, uh, nine times out of 10, I'm, I'm going to get back with them. So hell yeah. And the dates for the ABFL contests are June 1st in Texas, July 13th in North Carolina and August 3rd in Cleveland, Ohio. I feel like I don't have anything going on. So I think I'm going to have to go to that. Dude, which one? Cleveland. It's only an hour for me. Dude, that'd be dope, man. And if I go, you want to do a bike check for me? Dude, we'll do a bike check, bro. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, this has been Terry Adams. Probably one of the most information-packed podcasts I've ever done. So thank you. Dude, thank you for having me. Um, I, I can't wait to see uh, the little little clips and stuff you put together from it. I'm excited about it for sure. Yes. Yeah, so everybody check them out. Buy a Maja Day frame if you want to ride Flatland. And go to use take it to an ABFL contest and pick up some raising canes and Red Bull on the way. <laughs> there you go, man. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Brant. You're the man, bro.